tonight I am going to talk to you about antidote literature, books that help cure you of other books that you've read. And I would love to know if you have any books which have traumatised you and brought you into the state that I'm in, cuddling a giant rabbit, because I was traumatised, like so many, by Watership Down. And this topic actually came to mind because Damien Barr last week was talking about animals in literature, and he mentioned how he had been traumatised by Watership Down in his childhood, like so many children of the 1970s were, not just because of the book, but because of the film. It's a book by Richard Adams, which is actually a really fantastic novel, and one which I would recommend that everyone does read, uh, whether an adult or a child. But I would say read it with caution, because you may, like me, never look at rabbits in the same way again. And frankly, look what's happened to me. It's all down to Watership Down and also Beatrix Potter. As we go along this evening, do comment and tell me if you have any particular books that have traumatised you. I've already had quite a lot of comments coming in, which is great. And I'd love to know which are the books that lingered with you and maybe scarred you for life. And if you have any, which obviously I hope you don't, I hope that you haven't been traumatised by novels like me, but if you do have any, let me know what they are and I will attempt to give you a cure in the form of another book. So I am going to start off by talking about Watership Down, which is the book that started off the whole idea. Um, it's by Richard Adams and it, it is a book that was written initially by the author. It was his first novel in order to entertain his two daughters in the car on long car journeys. And that's the way that so many books began as uh, for children, particularly as books to entertain the author's children. Many people since the book was written and published and became a bestseller have conjectured that Watership Down had another message behind it, that maybe it was a political satire and that it was talking about communism. But Richard Adams himself always maintained that it was simply a book about rabbits to entertain his children on long car journeys. And he started off telling the story on a hundred mile car journey. He then carried on writing it on the way to school over the next few months. And in the end, his children begged him to try and publish it. He was rejected seven times. Um, aspiring authors, it always makes you happy to know that, uh, when a great bestseller was rejected many, many times. And he only actually got published after he sent the book to a very, very small publisher who were printing little wooden books. And he thought that they might love his book because they had recently published a book that was all about nature. And verily, they did publish Watership Down. And soon it was not just a bestseller in the UK, but it went over to the US, was published there, became a massive bestseller over there, and then came back to the UK in true enormous force. Um, but I want to start by reading to you a really fabulous review of the book that I found on Goodreads by Rico. Today, I don't know who Rico is, but I love him. It made me laugh uproariously. I've been searching for him ever since, but he wrote this review back in 2005. And there's no sign of him ever since. Rico, if you're watching, come back. We love you and we want to hear more of your reviews. I'll just read you what he said. Oh man, this book totally tricked me. This is about Watership Down for anyone that's joining now. I got a bad haircut one day, so I needed to lay low for a few weeks. 
Super cats, my super cuts, my ass, liars. I called two of my hardest, most straight up thug homies, Zachary and Dustin, to bring me some of their books, and this was one of them. I had just watched a show on A and E about WW2 naval battles, so I couldn't wait to read Watership Down. I love sea stories, man overboard and off the port bow, and AA chap, cap'n, and all that stuff. So I pulled my hat down and started reading. This book totally tricked me. There weren't any torpedoes. <laughs> no anchors await. No old salts telling tales of sea serpents and sexy narwhals. No peg legs, no giant squid, nothing. It had rabbits. This book totally tricked me. Crazy thing is, it was awesome. Bigwig is the man, the rabbit man. Before I was even done, I took one of my Rick Springfield posters, flipped it over and drew Bigwig, protecting the rest of the Warren, my favourite part. It came out wrong. I can't draw. So I kind of have a fat dog standing in a hole hanging on my wall, but I don't care. And I still give this book five stars. You should read it. This book totally tricked me, says Rico. Rico, we love you. You are a very witty and fabulous reviewer. Um, and I'm sure probably everyone does know the story out there of Watership Down, but in a nutshell, it's about some rabbits who have to flee their warren because mankind are coming to build houses over their warren. And Fiverr, who's the hero of the tale, really, is a kind of Cassandra-like figure who gets prophetic dreams He's the fifth in his letter, which is why he's called Fiverr. And when he has these prophetic dreams of what will happen to his rabbit gang, um, he he, real, no, he realises that no one's going to ever listen to him. He's like Cassandra in that sense. He's the prophet who is doomed never to be heard, never to be listened to. So Fiverr and a few of his trusty friends escape the Warren and go forth to find the idyll as they believe, that is Watership Down. And I won't tell you more because you've got to read the story. It is an excellent read. And I'm just going to read you a little bit of it to give you an inkling of the loveliness of the prose. It's a really beautifully written book. It's a book that when Richard Adams took it to the publishers, they were initially saying no to it because it was written in quite a grown-up style. Um, but it was about rabbits and the publishers thought the younger kids will find it difficult because the writing style is too old. The older kids won't like it because it's all about rabbits. Ha! How wrong they proved to be as this book proved to be an absolutely epic multi-million best-selling novel which is still read to this day and I still meet a lot of people um, out there who love reading Watership Down, even globally. So here's a little excerpt from Watership Down by Richard Adams, which has scarred many a uh, young person for life. The primroses were over. Towards the edge of the wood, the ground became open and sloped down to an old fence and a brambly ditch beyond. Only a few patches of pale yellow still showed among the dog's mercury and oak tree roots. On the other side of the fence, the upper part of the field was full of rabbit holes. In places, the grass had gone altogether, and everywhere there were clusters of dry droppings, through which nothing but the ragwort would grow. A hundred yards away, at the bottom of the slope, ran the brook, no more than three feet wide, half choked with king cups, watercress and blue brook lime. The cart track crossed by a brick culvert and climbed the opposite slope to a five-barred gate in the thorn hedge. The gate led to the lane. The May sunset was red in clouds and there was still half an hour to twilight. The dry slope was dotted with rabbits, some, nib some nibbling at the thin grass near their holes, others pushing further down to look for dandelions or perhaps a cowslip that the rest had missed. Here and there, one sat upright on an ant heap and looked about, with ears erect and nose in the wind. But a blackbird, 
singing undisturbed on the outskirts of the wood, showed that there was nothing alarming there, and in the other direction along the brook, all was plain to be seen, empty and quiet. The warren was at peace. At the top of the bank, close to the wild cherry where the blackbird sang, was a little group of holes, almost hidden by brambles. In the green half-light at the mouth of one of these holes, two rabbits were sitting together side by side. At length, the larger of the two came out, slipped along the bank under cover of the brambles, and so down into the ditch and up into the field. A few moments later, the other followed. The first rabbit stopped in a sunny patch and scratched his ear with rapid movements of his hind leg. Although he was a yearling and still below full weight, he had not the harassed look of most outskirters, that is, the rank and file of ordinary rabbits in their first year, who lacking their aristocratic parentage or unusual size and strength, get sat on by their elders and live as best they can, often in the open, on the edge of their warren. He looked as though he knew how to keep take care of himself. There was a shrewd, buoyant air about him as he sat up, looked around and rubbed both front paws over his nose. As soon as he was satisfied that all was well, he laid back his ears and set to work on the grass. So that's the very beginning of Watership Down. And as you can tell from that short passage, the rabbits are very much humanised. They're given human characteristics and they all represent characters that Richard Adams knew well from his own life. And he was always very willing to talk about that. Um, he did insist that the book was not an allegory, but many people nowadays see it as a rallying call for humans to stop destroying the landscape and the world of nature. So this is a book which is very much renowned for having affected a lot of people quite negatively because it was so um, traumatising, both as a book and as a novel. Um, oh, it's great to see you here, Tracy. Um, I'm actually managing to see the comments on Facebook at last. Do tell me, anyone, if you do have any books that have traumatised you. Have you been traumatised by Watership Down, I wonder, um, like so many? So thinking of cures for Watership Down and other cures for um, rabbit-based novels, some would say that Beatrix Potter and her books could be seen as positive rabbit depictions. But personally, I find Beatrix Potter as disturbing, if not more so, uh, than I find Watership Down. I've always had a deep and intense horror of animals dressed up as humans, and I've never been able to cope with meeting rabbits, particularly very large rabbits, ever since reading Beatrix Potter. Because when I meet very large rabbits, um, whether it's in a farm or in someone's house, God forbid, or in somebody's garden, I always feel like that giant rabbit is actually a human dressed up as a rabbit. What a disturbing thought. <laughs> I really can't cope with rabbits for that exact reason. And I lay, I place, I point the finger of blame squarely in the direction of Beatrix Potter. I know there are a lot of Beatrix Potter fans out there. Um, many is the time that I've been in the Lake District with many a uh, Beatrix Potter fan. And there's even a museum that you can go to in the Lake District and you can find out all about the great woman's life. She is an amazing artist. I can't deny that. She does fabulous drawings. Look at those. But they're very disturbing. And I really can't cope with those humanised animals that she drew so delicately and so beautifully. 
I wonder if any of you are lovers of Beatrix Potter. This is the only one that I have, I have to say, in my house because I really am not a fan of Beatrix Potter and such was my lack of enjoyment of those books that I'm afraid I didn't even share them with my kids. That's how mean I am and how much I don't enjoy Beatrix Potter. But some would say that reading Beatrix Potter could be a good cure for having read Watership Down because Beatrix Potter does depict generally quite positive um, rabbity interactions, though not always. There are farmers shooting at rabbits in those books. So I would suggest perhaps a better cure for having read Watership Down would be, uh, now where's my book? The True Deceiver by Tove Janssen, which I'm just searching for on my desk to show you and share with you. So that's a book by one of my favourite authors, Tove Janssen, who wrote the Moomin Troll books, which we all know and love. This is one of her adult books, and it's about an artist who depicts woodland scenes, which are very beautifully painted, with rabbits slightly unexpectedly drawn into the woodland scenes. And this is a fabulous read. I would highly recommend it. It couldn't be further away, really, from Watership Down. And it actually does have its own strangeness and slightly disturbing aspects. But I think if you're feeling traumatised by Watership Down, do read The True Deceiver because it shows rabbits in a very different light, for one thing. And it also shows artists and humans in a very interesting and different light. I'll just read you a bit from it to give you an inkling of the way the rabbits come into the books. Here we go. Perhaps the reason people called Anna Amelin nice was because nothing had ever forced her to exhibit malice and because she had an uncommon ability to forget unpleasant things. She just shook them off and continued in her own vague but stubborn way. In fact, her spoiled benevolence was frightening, but no one had ever had time to notice. On those rare occasions when visitors came to the rabbit house, she dispatched them quickly with an absent-minded graciousness that left them feeling they had paid their respects to some kind of lesser monument. It was not that Anna protected herself with an attitude, nor could it rightly be said that she hid her true face. It was simply that she was only fully alive when she devoted herself to her singular ability to draw. And when she drew, she was naturally always alone, even though, as it turns out, she has imaginary rabbits in her head. Anna Emmerlin had the great persuasive power of monomania, of being able to see and embrace a single idea, of being interested in one thing only. And that one thing was the woods, the forest floor. Anna Emelin could render the ground in a forest so faithfully and in such minute detail that she missed not the tiniest needle. Her watercolours were small and implacably naturalistic, and they were as pretty as the springy blanket of mosses and delicate plants that a person walks across in a dense forest, but seldom really observes. Anna and Emeline made people see. They saw and recalled the essence of the forest, and for a moment experienced a vague yearning that felt pleasant and hopeful. It was a shame that Anna spoiled her pictures by putting rabbits in them. That is to say, Mama, Papa and Baby Bunny. Moreover, the fact that she drew little flowers on the rabbits dispelled much of the deep forest mystique. The children's book page had criticised the rabbits on a number of occasions. And that hurt Anna and shook her confidence. But what could she do? The rabbits had to be there for the sake of the children and the publisher. A new book came out about every other year. The publisher wrote the text. Sometimes Anna wanted to draw just the ground, the low vegetation, the tree roots, more and more precisely, and in smaller and smaller scale, so deep and close to the moss that as its miniature brown and green world became an enormous jungle populated by insects. She could imagine a family of ants instead of rabbits 
But now, of course, it was too late. Anna tidied away her mental picture of the empty, liberated landscape. It was winter, and she never worked until the first bare earth began to show. While she waited, she wrote letters to very small children who wanted to know how the bunnies got flowery fur. So that's a very interesting book with bunnies. And intriguingly, another great cure, I feel, for watership down wounded readers is The Year of the Hair by Arto Pasolina, which is a fantastic Finnish book all about a man who one day goes out on a work assignment on, down a road with his companion, who's another worker, and the hero, Vatanen, is having, having a midlife crisis. And when they're driving away, they accidentally, with their car, hit a hair, a young baby hair, a leveret, and that hair is injured. Then Vatanen picks up the hair and decides to walk along into the forest with the hair and go off on a series of adventures. And I think this is an excellent cure for watership down wounds because the hare is in no way anthropomorphized. He is purely and simply a hare, unsullied and uncomplicated by human emotions and our hero Vatanen and he go off on a merry picaresque adventure that takes a year, hence the title, a year of the, the year of the hare. And they have these interesting adventures which are in no way a kind of uh, discussion or dialogue between man and hare. They are purely adventures which happen to involve a hare as part of them. And it's a really good read. It does have an element of magical realism and it's a really great, fun and interesting, unusual read. That's The Year of the Hare by Arto Pasolina for anyone who's just joining. Uh, by the way, anyone who is just joining, do tell me if you have any particular books that have scarred you and made you feel traumatised, not just after finishing the book, but years later. In many instances, these might be childhood reads, but there are a lot of other reads that have been coming up in people's comments, which are from later on. So before we move on to other scarring books apart from Watership Down, I will just read to you from the story cure about um, how Watership Down, the book which has scarred so many, can cure your anxiety. So this is the story cure, um, an A to Z of books to keep kids happy, healthy and wise, which is a book that anyone who has any contact with children should have on their bookshelf because it's a great way of finding the right books to help you, um, to help kids in so many different ways. But also it's just a great way of finding great books to read with your children or teenagers or even for yourself because great books don't have to be just for kids, frankly. It's also illustrated really beautifully by Rohan Eason. Look at those lovely pictures on the cover. So A Cure for Anxiety is Watership Down. We also have some picture books as well as the Watership Down Cures, but you need to get the book to get the full cure. So here we go. The long-eared, twitchy-nosed inhabitants of Watership Down, a story which stands up so well to the test of time, will feel like kindred spirits to tweens and teens with an anxious streak constantly on the alert for danger as rabbits are. As long as they can hear the blackbird singing, the rabbits know it's safe to graze. But the second the blackbird song turns to a distressed squawking, the rabbits startle, sniff the air, then bolt like blazes in the other direction. When a sign goes up in their field announcing a new building development, 
fibre senses that something very bad is going to happen. As I was saying earlier, fiver has visions of the future and foresees the destruction of his whole warren. But like Cassandra, the prophetess, he's doomed not to be listened to by the rest of his family and the other rabbits that he lives with. He tells his brother, Hazel. Hazel has learned to listen to his brother's presentiments and that very night they split ranks with the heads of the warren and lead any other rabbit that will listen to a new safe home. Fiverr's sixth sense saves the rabbits again and again on their journey and ultimately brings them to the high dry downs where they can see for miles around. Many of the rabbits are prone to panic, but they also make the most of the strengths bestowed, bestowed on them by Fritha, their creator, in the stories of long ago. Digger, listener, runner, the incantation goes, and whenever they're threatened by one of their thousand enemies, they put their skills to use, digging burrows, listening for danger and running for safety. Give this story to the nervous child in your midst and prompt them to notice their own special strengths. They may not be able to stop their anxiety, but their strengths will help them to live more successfully with it. So that's um, from the Story Cure, a book that everyone needs to have in their household. And it's telling you why reading Watership Down can be a great cure for anxiety. Now, I do know that a lot of people have been traumatised by reading Watership Down and by watching the film, but it is a story in which ultimately um, the rabbits gain strength through the traumas that they go through. But there are quite a lot of traumas, let's face it. However, it is a brilliant and highly gripping read. So if you haven't read it, do give it a go. Another book, which I would also say is an excellent cure for anyone that's been deeply traumatised by Watership Down, is Oryx and Crake, which is by Margaret Atwood, which is an absolutely brilliant um, and, again, rather disturbing read. But it's a book which takes you into um, rather fabulous new directions. It's speculative fiction. So Margaret Atwood, who many of you will know from The Handmaid's Tale, has also written several books which are speculative fiction, particularly the trilogy Oryx and Craig, um, The Year of the Flood and Mad Adam, which are all brilliant reads. And in Oryx and Craig, there are luminous rabbits, which are created by man as a genetic experiment and that is pretty depressing and quite comic at the same time which is really what that book is like all the way through. It's very funny in a very dark way and I would actually thoroughly recommend it as an excellent read because it's uh, surprising at every turn. It is dystopian there's quite a lot of grim, awful things that happen it, in it. There are many cross-spliced species, such as pigoons, which are pigs crossed with raccoons, and many other weird and wonderful creatures. But Margaret Atwood based everything in that book on true science, believe it or not. So nothing in Oryx and Crake is totally made up or is completely fictional. She actually based everything on real science that was going on at the time when she wrote Oryx and Crake, and that was at least 20 years ago. And she then carried on with the theme in uh, The Year of the Flood and Mad Adam, and they're both absolutely brilliant, well, all three are absolutely brilliant books. I would completely urge you to read the trilogy they're also brilliant as an audio book, particularly Oryx and Crake, and they really do make you laugh a lot, even though they are grim and there are luminous rabbits bouncing around throughout the book. Now, one of uh, 
my followers on Twitter mentioned that they were deeply traumatised by that scene in Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy, which I wondered if um, any of you have read and if you know what that scene is. If you don't know what it is, I don't want to give it away because it is an incredibly shocking and terrible scene, which if you have read it, you will be scarred for life. There's just no two ways about it. It's one of the most shocking and awful scenes in the history of literature. But it is actually a great book, um, Jude the Obscure. And I wonder, is there an antidote to such a tale? I'm actually not quite sure if there is. And I'm going to be thinking about that uh, for the rest of the evening. But I suppose one could say that the, the scene that I'm talking about is incredibly traumatising because it's about children having an appalling time and being very depressed and not coming through in a positive way. So I feel that a good antidote to that would be a story in which children do actually come through after having been traumatised. And I actually think a good book that comes to mind as a cure for Jude the Obscure would be Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, because that is a story where children do have an awful time and suffer through great horror and misery, poverty and sadness, but they come through in the end. There's definitely other books which I think could be better um, cures, and I'm going to be thinking about that as we go on for the next few minutes. So I'll come back to that one. If anyone else has any suggestions, please do put them to me, because I'd love to hear your thoughts. Now, another book that has traumatised many a reader is American Psycho by Brett Easton Ellis, which is one of the most traumatising books I've personally ever read. And I'm sure that all of you might know it potentially from the film as well as from the book. And it's a book in which um, our hero, Nicholas Bateman, is obsessed with shopping, designer clothes, and having the best of everything. And he goes into great pitiless detail about his clothes and all the appurtenances in his very posh flat because he's extremely rich, working, pretend, I can't remember exactly what his job was, maybe a hedge fund manager, something like that, something in banking. And he, by night, is a, is a psycho. He kills women in really gruesome and hideous ways, which are frankly scenes which I wish I'd never read. And American Psycho is a deeply disturbing book, but one which many people think is absolutely brilliant. Um, so I think a good antidote for having read that book, if you have read it, is a book that I do love, which is called Fabulous Nobodies by Lee Tullock, which was written in 1984. And this is a book which I would say is the exact opposite of American Psycho because it's kind of fluffy. It's all about clothes, outfits and fashion. But it's actually very funny, very witty and razor sharp in its observation of human life. And I'm going to read you a little bit of it to give you a little insight into how good this book is. So Fabulous Nobodies by Lee Tullock, one of the funniest and most enjoyable reads that I have read in many a year and a perfect antidote for American Psycho. I'm standing on the door of the Less Is More Club, thinking about my fingernails. I'm up here above the throng, a fashion leader 
with the crowd below almost swooning at my feet, and I'm dressed impeccably from head to toe, except for three chipped nails on my right hand. Three chipped nails! This has never happened before. I always check my nails before I leave home. I know how tricky nails can be. Not a night goes by without my making sure the nail polish starts at the cuticles and ends at the tips, a perfect unsmudged slash of colour. I'm not the kind of girl just to slop it on. I'm sensitive to little details like chipped nail polish, including the wrong colour combinations, or sandals worn with woollen skirts, or pale blue eyeshadow, but especially chipped nail polish. Chip nail polish is almost the most upsetting thing in the universe after people who wear leg warmers. The fact that I'm standing up here with chipped nail polish, even though everyone else is too far away to see it, is a crisis. I know that my nails are chipped and as far as I'm concerned, I'm the only one who counts. The nail polish is flaking off almost to the cuticles. It's bubbling and blistering in the heat, like leg wax on the boil. Maybe I shouldn't have mixed any of that battleship grey house paint with Revlon Firma Nail. It seemed like a good idea at the time, especially as I didn't have the exact shade of grey at home to go with my silver Courage Mini, which I had my heart set on wearing tonight. It's a Courage kind of night. All steamy and noisy, like a walk down Carnaby Street in the summer of 1965. What a walk down Carnaby Street would have been like in the summer of 1965 if I'd been born then. I could stick to plain old Max Factor like everyone else, but that's so predictable. You can't be fabulous and predictable at the same time. This is one of the facts of life. The reason I'm fabulous is that I am never predictable. Even I can't predict what I'm going to do next. I have to act. I just can't stand here like this. Sooner or later, somebody fabulous is going to come up these stairs and home in on my nails like an eagle. Fabulous people know about nails. They look for them. Sooner or later, somebody fabulous is going to want to shake my hand or kiss it. Which means that sooner or later, I'm going to have to take it out of my purse. A girl can't pretend to be looking for her compact all night. I wish I'd worn gloves. Gloves make serious fashion statements and come in handy too. I decide. I dig around in the purse some more. It's got a plastic mother of pearl handle that slips neatly over my wrist and find my emery board. I hold my hand up in front of my face, splay the fingers out for everyone to see and start to scratch away at the old polish. The bits of grey paint flake off all over the astroturf like confetti at a wedding. If you're going to do something unpleasant, you might as well do it with style. The crowd below is getting restless. They're pushing and shoving and standing on tiptoes to see what I'm doing. I can feel a tremor of irritation as they watch me unscrew a bottle and apply strokes of base coat. They're wondering how I can stand here doing my nails when it's a matter of life and death for them that they get into the club. As far as I'm concerned, anyone who wonders why a girl would stop everything to repair her nails wouldn't be in a club like this anyway. So that is the heroine of Fabulous Nobodies. Her name is Reality, known to her friends and fans as Really, because her name doesn't fit her like a Schiaparelli glove. It's an appealing contemporary heroine. Young, pretty, adamant and broke. Sorry, that's the blurb from the back cover. And reality, or really, is a fashion icon, as you can tell from that beginning passage. Her job is to give the yay or nay as to whether people are allowed into the club that she is the bouncer at the door of, or not so much a dance bouncer, as the person in charge of whether you can come in or not. And she has racks and racks of clothes in her room, in her flat. She gives her clothes names. That's one of the things I love about her. So she calls her, her dresses frocks and she gives each of her frocks a different name. So they might be called Judy, they might be called Betty, they might be called Jane and so on. And she has a very intense relationship with each of her frocks and her trousers and shirts. She knows them intimately and she knows exactly when to wear 
each of her clothes for what occasion. And she is, frankly, a joyous character. She really is very funny. And it's a great read, which I'm calling a perfect antidote to American Psycho because it celebrates the joy of fashion and the joy of clothes without having a terrible and hideous, terrifying layer of psycho horror underneath, like we have in Brett Easton Ellis's American Psycho. Um, and reality does have her moments of deep despair, which are rather tragic to witness. And it's not just a story of frippery and folly. It's actually rather a great observation of living in a city back in the 80s and having to cope with the stresses and strains of urban life. Um, and I found it a really great book, so I would thoroughly recommend it. Moving on um, to Anna, who mentioned The Collector by John Fowles as a book that terribly traumatised her. And indeed, I can see why it was a book that traumatised her. It was John Fowles' first novel, and it is a brilliant book, not enormous. Um, John Fowles is also famous for The Magus, which is another amazing and brilliant book. Um, this book is called A Singularly Skilled First Novel, which it really is brilliantly written. And it's all about uh, the story of a kidnapping a nutty clerk captures and holds an art student that he has become fixated upon. And it's a strange story of sanity and insanity, as you can tell by that rather disturbing picture on the cover. I'll read you a little bit of it because then you'll see why it is a very disturbing novel. I have been out Sorry, it's a diary entrance, October the 19th, and this is the diary of the art student who's been captured. I have been out. I was copying all the afternoon, Piero, and I was in the sort of mood where normally I have to go out to the cinema or to a coffee bar, anywhere but out. I made him take me by giving myself to him like a slave. Bind me, I said, but take me. He bound and gagged me, held my arm and we walked around the garden. Quite a big one. It was very dark. I could just make out the path and some trees. And it is very lonely, right out in the country somewhere. Then suddenly, in the darkness, I saw something was wrong with him. I couldn't really see him, but I was suddenly frightened. I just knew he wanted to kiss me or something worse. He tried to say something about being very happy. His voice, very strained, choked, and then that I didn't think he had any deep feelings, but he had. It's so terrible not being able to speak. My tongue's my defence with him normally, my tongue and my look. There was a little silence, but I knew he was pent up. All the time, I was breathing in beautiful outdoor air. That was good, so good, I can't describe it. So living, so full of plant smells and country smells and a thousand mysterious wet smells of the night. Then a car passed. So there is a road which is used in front of the house. As soon as we heard the engine, his grip tightened. I prayed the car would stop, but its lights just swept past behind the house. Luckily, I'd thought it out before. If I ever try to escape and fail, he'll never let me out again. So I must not jump at the first chance. And I knew out there that he would have killed me rather than have let me get away. If I tried to run for it, I couldn't have anyway. He held my arm like a vice, but it was terrible, knowing other people were so near and knew nothing. He asked me if I wanted to go round again, but I shook my head. I was too frightened. Back down here, I told him that I had to get the sex business cleared up. I won't read any more because I don't want to give it all away, but it's really good and really disturbing. And Anna, who was replying to my Instagram uh, story earlier said that that's a book that she was traumatised by. So an antidote for that, for Anna, 
I think, oh yeah, Anne is saying, also, I couldn't finish The Collector, just too traumatic for me. That is, I can understand, to be honest. I think it is an incredibly um, shocking and awful book. Sorry, Anne, if I've been um, disturbing you by reading that out now. Look at the rabbit. Uh, let's think about nice, happy bunnies, not scary watership down bunnies. Um, so a good cure for that, perhaps, is the book The Power by Naomi Alderman, which is a fantastic read and some would say a great antidote to the collector because it's a book in which the women have the power. It's a book, if you haven't read it, um, it's not a terrible giveaway if I reveal that uh, the very quite near the beginning, the women, adolescent women, teenagers, wake up with an amazing power. They have a kind of electricity in their bodies, which they slowly discover doesn't happen overnight, which means that they can jolt out electricity. They can literally send forth a kind of lightning bolt, which means that they have the power to overcome men. So if they are being attacked by men, then they will be able to zap them. So they literally have superhuman powers as if they are a, hit, a super heroine, a kind of Wonder Woman. And it's a really interesting novel because Naomi Alderman imagines what it would be like if the women did have the power and were stronger than men physically, which they do become because they have this extra power which the men don't get. And there's one woman that gets it first, she becomes called Eve, and slowly more and more women wake up with the power and they realise what they can do with it. And they mostly use it for positive purposes at first, but then slowly some of these women become corrupt and also they begin to use the power in a negative way. And some of them even use it against men in the ways that men have used their power against women previously. And this is all quite a terrible and shocking development. And I would say that's where it gets into something rather darker and perhaps not actually such a good antidote as a book for reading The Collector um, by John Powell's. But it is a really good book about empowerment and female empowerment and very interesting. And I do think Naomi Alderman takes it in a really interesting direction in terms of thinking about what power does to people, both positively and negatively. So The Power by Naomi Alderman could be a really good cure, some would say. But on the other hand, a more positive antidote for reading a book like The Collector could be to read the fabulous and gorgeous book Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnim, which is a book that has no dark currents underneath it. It is completely positive and upbeat. It's also very funny, very witty and very beautifully written. And I don't know anyone who's read it who hasn't liked it. It's such a lovely, charming funny and interesting, great read. Um, I would say it's the equivalent of reading P.G. Woodhouse, who's also always a fabulous antidote to reading books that are depressing and grim. Another book which has traumatised many a reader and given them a kind of PTSD of reading is The White Hotel, by D.M. Thomas, which is a fantastically grim novel, which, like American Psycho, I do wish in a way that I had never read, because the images in the book are incredibly disturbing. Uh, that is because a lot of it takes place during the time of the Nazis, and some really terrible and hideous things are done in the, in the Nazis' name and under their regime. Um, Calypso is mentioning that The Curse of the Were-Rabbit is a very scary story, which is very true. And actually, this rabbit is somewhat reminiscent of the enormous rabbit in The Curse of the Were-Rabbit. Um, and actually, I must say, 
It's a great story and it would be a really good antidote also, I feel, to Watership Down as a film. Um, I'm not sure if it was ever a book. It would be great if it was a book. Anyway, going back to uh, DM Thomas and the White Hotel, that is a really disturbing book, very scarring and very depressing. I would say a good antidote to reading that book would be The Book Thief, which is an absolutely fantastic read by Marcus Zusak, which is a great novel, also set during the time of the Nazis. And it's many of you will probably have seen, read it or even seen the film um, because it's also a really great film. And that's a book which I feel is a really good antidote to The White Hotel because it's also set in the time of the Nazis. But although it does have awful things that happen in it, so it's by no means all positive, as you'd expect from a book set in that period, it does have some positive outcomes. It's also about the importance and the power of reading um, because the heroine is always trying to liberate books so that she can read in order to stay sane. Many of us know about that impulse. And I would say that it would be a really excellent um, read to cure you from the cure of, from the, from the trauma of the White Hotel. So The Book Thief is an excellent read. And just trying to think if there's any other brilliant reads from that era and written about that subject. Um, another one that's brilliant, I think, is The Silver Sword, which I think a lot of you will know, which is, again, it is a depressing book because, um, again, it's set in the time of the Nazis. It's by Ian Serralier and um, it's a children's book, but it is a book full of hope because the boy that's the hero in the book is keeping on to a symbol of hope in the form of the silver sword which his parents gave him and he feels that if he keeps the silver sword with him he will be reunited with his parents and the book is all about his journey to look for his parents again and um, I won't tell you what happens but it is a much more positive read than the White Hotel put it that way. Now I wonder if any of you have any other books that you either were traumatised by or that you think are great antidotes to the trauma of a book that you've read. I think it's a really interesting route to go down and I will revisit this subject because it's interesting to think about a journey that takes you from one book to the next. So you read a book which you're traumatised by, you then read another book as an antidote to it. And then you're going to need another book as an antidote to that. And you could go on in that way forever. And actually, that does lead me to another book that made me um, think about this subject, because I was really traumatised when I finished it, which was The Great Golden Circle by, now I'm suddenly having a terrible blank on his name, I've only just read the book and I absolutely loved it. Uh, I'm having to look it up. Um, any minute it will come up. Sorry, having a blank. The Great Golden Circle. In my excitement, I've just completely lost my brain, which is really annoying. Is anyone out there watching who can help? Um, now, hang on. The author, we can get to it this way, also wrote one of my favourite books, Benjamin Myers. That's his name. So Benjamin Myers wrote a fantastic book that I've just read called The Great, I think it's The Great Golden Circle. Um, and it's all about crop circles. He also wrote The Offing, which is one of my favourite recent books. Um, which I have talked about before. And this book by Benjamin Myers, I know lots of you won't have read yet because it's only just come out. The Perfect Golden Circle, sorry, that's what it's called. The Perfect Golden Circle. So I don't want to give anything away about it, but it's about 
two men who are obsessed with creating crop circles and that's what they do during one hot perfect summer in the 1980s they spend their nights creating amazing crop circles and viewing all sorts is mentioning that they love this book are you talking about the great golden circle or are you talking about another one let me know um so it's a gorgeous book in which two men are trying to strive for perfection and art and they're looking for something beyond themselves beyond mere mortality even and beyond gain beyond filthy lucre they're doing it purely for love and for the sake of art it's definitely a book I'm going to come back to again and it's really a perfect book but when I came to the end I was traumatized and I want to talk to other people about that book so anyone that's read it I think we need to have a little group get together I'm thinking about starting a book club online. If anyone is interested, let me know, because I would really like to talk about that book with people. And it would be fun to do a book club with all you lovely people that come and join me on a regular basis. So think about that. Let me know if you're interested. Viewing all sorts is saying The Silver Sword is lovely, which I totally agree. It's a fabulous book. So thank you for that. It is a book full of hope. Um, the Great Golden Circle and Benjamin Myers generally is a fabulous author that I adore. And The Offing is also a book full of hope. And so is The Great Golden Circle. I know he's written some other books which are possibly a bit more on the negative side of life. But he's an author that I'm slowly discovering and they're the only two of his that I've read so far. Thanks for the thumbs up doing all sorts on the book club idea. I think it would be really fun. So watch this space. I will think about how to set that up. So on that merry, hopeful and positive note, thanks so much for joining me tonight. It's been lovely sharing antidotes with you. I'd love to hear any more books that you might have that have traumatised you or books that you think would be great antidotes to other reads. And I am going to go down the route one of these evenings of antidotes to antidotes too um but it all started with watership down and the rabbits so i'll see you next week thanks for joining me um and have a great night happy reading good night <laughs>